Good evening, everybody, and thanks so much for being here. I'm Peter Fish, and I'm very pleased to serve as the jury chair of the Commonwealth Club's 91st Annual California Book Awards. Tonight, we celebrate more than nine decades of our honoring the extraordinary diversity and creativity of California writers. Our award-winning writers will be joining us by video from the comforts of their own homes. Joining me as hosts here at the Commonwealth Club are my esteemed co-jurors, Roz Chang and Sarah Rosenthal. Over its 91 years, the California Book Awards has honored many of the most important voices in American literature. Among them, Joan Didion, Ishmael Reed, Amy Tan, Hector Tobar, and Viet Thanh Nguyen. We give awards in eight categories, fiction, first fiction, nonfiction, juvenile, young adult, poetry, Californiana, and contribution to publishing. For all the categories, our criteria are pretty simple. The winning books have to have been written here in California and published in the past year, and they have to be superlatively, unforgettably good. As you'll see, this year's award winners are all that. They range in setting from 1970s India to contemporary Los Angeles. In subject matter, they encompass California's wildfire crisis and the heartbreaking challenges faced by immigrants trying to feel at home in America. Now, before we start the awards, a few very heartfelt thanks. First, to Commonwealth Club President and CEO Gloria Duffy for her continuing support and encouragement of the awards program. Thanks to Sean Burmeister, the club's book manager, who coordinates getting hundreds of books from across the nation into our jury's hands. And thanks to the club's tech wizards, Mark Kirchner and Spencer Campbell, who make our online award show happen. A special thanks, too, to the late Dr. Martha Cox, longtime Book Award juror and founder of the Center for Steinbeck Studies at San Jose State University. Her generous gift enables us to give cash grants to each of our award winners. And great thanks to our Book Award jurors. They spend months reading, discussing, and debating the hundreds of books that are submitted for award consideration. Then they have the tough but rewarding job of selecting the best of the best for these awards. So many, many thanks to Roz Chang, Christopher Chen, Roy Eisenhart, Gravity Goldberg, Mary Ellen Hannibal, Alden Mudge, Denise Newman, Suzanne Rebecca, Sarah Rosenthal, Stephen Saum, Julia Flynn Seiler, Lauren Silver, and Mary Topher. I also want to mention a couple of Commonwealth Club California Book Awards related programs. First, we have the excellent Reading Californians Book Club, which sponsors online discussions with many of our winning writers. You can find more information about these programs on the club's website. And this year, for the first time in California Book Awards history, young people are participating in the process. The Commonwealth Club's Creating Citizens Civic Education Initiative has partnered with the National Writing Project to bring the Book Awards to a new generation. Students aged 13 and older have been invited to read the juvenile and young adult literature finalists and to publish their thoughts about the books on a dedicated website. Anyone who needs free books in order to participate can request them. We hope you'll take some time to see the creative and thoughtful responses that young people have posted. You'll find more information on the Commonwealth Club website, or you can visit writingourfuture.nwp.org. And for any students or adults who know students watching tonight, we'd love to have you join the project too. Visit the website, choose a book or more than one book, and let us know what you think. Now, on to our award-winning books and authors. Our first category is fiction, presented by Roz Chang. Thank you, Peter. The finalists for fiction are Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen, The Committed by Viet Tan Nguyen, Great Circles by Maggie Shipstead, The Archer by Shruti Swami. The winner of our gold medal in fiction is The Archer by Shruti Swami. A young Indian woman wrestles with her own autonomy 
self-identity and desires in this coming-of-age novel, which is set in India during the 1960s and 1970s. Kathak, a classic form of storytelling through dance, becomes her escape route for societal norms. With a lyrical, sensual, and dreamy quality, the Catholic dancer unveils her own story. Now, we'll hear from Shruti Swami. Hello, everyone. I wanted to say thank you so much for this wonderful and frankly, very unexpected honor. And um, thank you so much to the Commonwealth Club. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to my editor, Betsy Glick, and my agent, Samantha Shea, as well as my parents, Asha Pandya and Sanjay Iyer, who perhaps sometimes, despite their better judgment, always encouraged my dream of being a writer. Um, the Archer is a book about a, a woman, Vidya, who wants to be free free to make choices about her body and her future, free to make art on her own terms. We're in a moment in this country where many people are facing the end of the, the freedoms that Vidya so longs for. I was raised in a world where the end of Roe v. Wade was an unthinkable dystopian future. My daughter will likely be raised in a world where this is her present reality. And the women and people who have already lived in the margins of our society because of their race or class or disability or sexual orientation must continue to live with their already few freedoms ever more cruelly curtailed. I can't equate the act of writing for me with any kind of political protest. It is too delicate, too complicated, and too personal for that. And yet, at least in one way, it is. I write to be free. Let us meet in our stories and be free together. Let us dream of ways to fight this freedom into our world. Thank you. The winner of our silver medal in fiction is The Committed by Viet Tan Nguyen. Set in the 1980s, the story follows the man of two faces and two minds, a former Vietnamese spy who has survived a communist re-education camp. Along with his blood brother, he flees to Paris, France, where the two discover capitalism in the form of drug dealing. Full of ideologies, gangsters, and words and phrases with dual and sometimes triple meanings, this is a novel of big ideas driven by a fascinating narrative, voice, and inventive plot. And now, let's hear from Viet Tan Nguyen. Hello, Commonwealth Club. It's an honor to be the recipient, yet again, of a California Book Award. The first time I received one was for my novel, The Sympathizer. Recently, I learned that The Sympathizer is being turned into a TV series by HBO, which means that if you haven't read The Sympathizer yet, you never have to read The Sympathizer. You can just watch it on TV. This California Book Award is for the sequel to The Sympathizer, The Committed. When I set out to write The Sympathizer, my intention was to offend everybody, Americans, anti-communist Vietnamese, and communist Vietnamese. Judging from my hate mail, I succeeded. So in writing The Committed, the first thing I asked myself was, who else is there left to offend? The answer, obviously, was the French. Actually, the French have mostly taken the book with good humor, and so has your jury. So first of all, thanks to the jury for the incredibly hard work in reading through a year of worthwhile fiction. Thanks also to my wise agents, Nat Sobel and Judith Weber, and the terrific people at my publisher, Grove Atlantic. Morgan Intrigan, Deb Seeger, John Mark Bowling, Judy Hottinson, Elizabeth Schmitz, Emily Burns, and my brilliant editor, Peter Blackstock. And of course, thanks also to my ever supportive partner, Lan Yung, and our children. Ellison, whose impending birth compelled me to finish The Sympathizer, and Simone, to whom The Committed is dedicated. The Committed is a novel about the necessity and ambiguities of commitment. Commitment to a belief, to a political cause, to writing, but most of all, to hope, no matter how foolish that hope may seem. We're living in some difficult times, and now, more than ever, I hope writers and readers stay committed to foolish hope and to the sometimes seemingly foolish and useless love of literature. Thanks again, Commonwealth Club, for doing your part in keeping that love alive. 
Our next category is First Fiction, presented by Sarah Rosenthal. Thank you, Roz. As its name proclaims, our first fiction category honors books by California authors who have not previously published a book of fiction. Our finalists are Skinship by Yoon Choi, City of a Thousand Gates by Rebecca Sachs, and After Parties by Anthony Wiesna So. The winner of our gold medal in first fiction is Skinship by Yoon Choi. An immigrant wife broods on religion and a traumatic memory. A grandfather suffers from Alzheimer's. A teenager, along with her mother and brother, escapes an abusive father to find unwelcome refuge in the house of a more successful aunt. Told in vivid, assured prose, the stories in this collection make the experiences of several first and second generation Korean American families linger in the reader's imagination long after the last page has turned. And now, let's hear from Yoon Choi. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club for this great honor and to the jury for their passion and dedication in engaging with the work of so many Californian writers. My debut collection, Skinship, tells the stories of Koreans and Korean Americans. In the imaginations of Korean immigrants of a certain generation, you can almost say that there are two countries in America, the country known as the United States and the country of California. California was the dream, a year round summer with no monsoons, a Korea town where the kimchi was better than what you'd find in Seoul, your children gaining admission to the crown jewels of the American public education system, the UCs, or they could get into Stanford. Of course, there is a deeper, darker, and more complicated history of Koreans in California. Starting from the moment the first Korean migrants set foot in San Francisco over a hundred years ago, to the LA race riots in 1992, to the continued racial, economic, and sociological issues we continue to grapple with today. And so it is with a sense of being part of a much larger history, as well as a feeling of deep gratitude and luck, that I accept an award that is in essence a celebration of California. A big thank you to my agent Joy, my editor Diana, my immigrant parents, and my family, including my four Californian kids who have never called any other place home. Thank you so much. For our silver medal in first fiction, the winner is Rebecca Sachs for City of a Thousand Gates. A 14-year-old Israeli girl is murdered by a Palestinian terrorist. A young Palestinian man is beaten into a coma in retribution. Thus begins this riveting multi-plot novel about the present day Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Sachs realistically depicts each of her numerous characters' viewpoints while planting us in the midst of a separate and unequal society where Palestinians must deal daily with the large and small brutalities of life under occupation. And now we'll hear from Rebecca Sachs. Hello to the Commonwealth Club of California, and uh, thank you for this silver medal. Uh, it's such an honor, and um, thank you to the jury with, with, for reading me with such open hearts. I wanted to call in the memory of two people, uh, actually neither of whom I knew personally, but both of whom feel uh, very present to me today. The first is my fellow nominee, Anthony Visna So. Uh, who was lost far too young and it, it's such a loss for, for all of his fans, uh, in, including me, that we will not get to read um, what he would have written next. And the second person is the great, the great Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. Shireen was killed in May while reporting on a Israeli military raid in the West Bank. And I don't think we can yet 
really fully comprehend the magnitude of her loss and, and the loss of such a iconic Palestinian voice. Sometimes uh, after reading City of a Thousand Gates, a reader will tell me that, you know, before they didn't pay a lot of specific attention to the news coming out of Israel and Palestine, but after reading the novel, the, they felt sort of more connected emotionally and began paying more attention, which of course I find uh, so incredibly encouraging and moving and, and it honors me. And may, they may also send a, uh, a news clip or an image and say, you know, isn't it, isn't it almost as if your book anticipated this, even though it's a work of fiction? And this happened recently uh, with images of Shireen's funeral, during which uh, mourners attempting to carry her casket were attacked and beaten by um, Israeli police. And someone sent this to me and, and, and compared it to something in City of a Thousand Gates as, as if I'd somehow anticipated this. And I, I had to say, no, <laughs> you know, uh, everything I wrote, fiction um, or imaginative, notwithstanding, uh, depicted in a material reality that is unfolding, that has been unfolding and continues to unfold. And one that, you know, Shireen herself gave her life to documenting. Um, so, you know, may, may we all operate with the most courage and the most compassion um, in, in her memory. And you know, may both their, their memories be a blessing. And, and very quickly, such a, a warm thank you to Joy and Terry and Jane and Jonathan um, and my parents and, and Katie. Um, thank you. Our next category is poetry. Here our finalists are Permanent Volta by Rosie Stockton, Refractive Africa by Will Alexander, Yellow Rain by Miter Vang, and Blood on the Fog by Tongo Eisen Martin. And the winner of our gold medal in poetry is Refractive Africa by Will Alexander. Refractive Africa tackles the devastating effects of colonialism and celebrates the brilliance of Africa and the African diaspora. Homages to two innovative writers, Amos Tutuola and Jean-Joseph Rabea Rivolo, bookend a long poem focused on the history and current situation of the Congo channeling a shamanistic, expansive, and incantatory English in order to imagine a space where colonial violence can be healed. Alexander, quote, seduces reality by inflammatory crystal, by phonemes spun from eclipse and fire. Let's hear from Will Alexander. I'd like to thank the California Book Awards and their judges for acknowledging Refractive Africa, Ballet of the Forgotten. And also I'd like to thank my editor, of course, at New Directions, uh, Jeffrey Yang, for doing such an excellent job. And also I want to thank my partner, Sheila, for this, Sheila Scott Wilkinson, for her general support in making this endeavor possible. It's been quite a journey, and I've been in the midst of doing many, many works during this time period of the past two years. But my main essence was to get to the essence of what Africa means to the world, not as a, some separative, uh, superimposed part, but as an endemic factor of our, our living on this earth as we know it, from golf clubs to the uh, pentalium that we use in our cell phones. Everything seems to come out of this region, but we're putting more emphasis on other parts of the world. And I wanted to shed some light on a region that has a GDP of less than $1,000 a year. This is very important to, to bring a consciousness to the uh, situation of beings on the planet Earth, not as some kind of apocalyptic portent, but as an as a organic acknowledgement, lingual acknowledgement, also getting into the uh, understanding of the different stratas of the complexity of Africa 
the uh, Jean Joseph Rabbi Ravello, the great Madagascan poet, and uh, Amos, of course, Amos Tutuola in uh, West African uh, country of Nigeria. And I want to thank all of my, all of the general support that I've received over this time. And uh, again, I would like to thank the uh, California Book Awards for acknowledging my work. And I uh, hope that indeed this can be a, uh, will be a protracted relationship, a protracted positive relationship in terms of getting this, allowing this work to get a more, a larger or broader circulation in the world. I thank you. Our next category is nonfiction presented by Peter Fish. Our nonfiction finalists are Midnight in Washington, How We Almost Lost Our Democracy and Still Could by Adam Schiff, Life as We Made It, How 50,000 Years of Human Innovation Refined and Redefined Nature by Beth Shapiro, Light on Fire, The Art and Life of Sam Francis by Gabrielle Seltz, Paradise, One Town's Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire by Lizzie Johnson, her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It by Ladoris Hazard Cordell. And the winner of our gold medal in nonfiction is Paradise, One Town's Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire by Lizzie Johnson. Paradise, One Town's Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire is a tour de force of reporting by a former San Francisco Chronicle reporter now at the Washington Post about the devastating campfire that ravaged the Sierra Foothills town of Paradise in 2018. Based on hundreds of hours of heart-wrenching interviews with survivors of the fire, Johnson reconstructs moment by moment this disaster as it unfolded, showing deep empathy for this working class community and a sharp-eyed look at the structural issues leading to this catastrophe. Johnson's work is gripping, powerful, and unforgettable. And now, let's hear from Lizzie Johnson. Wow, it is such an honor to be named the gold medal winner in nonfiction this year for my book, Paradise, which if you haven't read, is about a small foothills town and its people. And what happens one November morning in 2018, when a piece of PG&E electrical equipment failed and sparked California's most destructive wildfire. This award is bittersweet because in so many ways, I wish I never would have had a reason to write it. The campfire burned 18,804 buildings. It killed 85 people. Tens of thousands of more lives were forever changed by November 8th. Before the campfire ignited, I'd spent years driving across the Golden State, writing about wildfires for the San Francisco Chronicle. I practically lived out of my car. I kept a pillow in my back seat sleeping after I filed stories to my editor and stocked my trunk with canned peaches, vegetarian soup, and my favorite, cosmic brownies. My hair usually smelled like smoke. I decided to write this book in part because year after year, it felt like people were forgetting about these fires and the people whom they impacted. So this award is really about paradise. At the heart of my book are real people forced to make impossible decisions. Rochelle, a new mother with an infant on her lap, who turns to the stranger driving the car she's in and asks him to take the baby and run, if it comes down to it. Kevin, a school bus driver with 23 little kids in the back, who asks the two teachers on board to make a manifest of their names in case they don't survive. And Travis, a man who outpaces the blaze on a four-wheeler, living when his neighbor does not. This recognition from the California Commonwealth Club means the world to me because it means that these people have not and will not be forgotten. It's an honor to know them. This award acknowledges their courage and their bravery. And this award acknowledges what we as Californians stand to lose in a new age of climate change and mega fires. It still isn't over for the people of paradise, for Rochelle, Kevin and Travis, even as this award ceremony goes on, 
They're still struggling to rebuild their lives, to regain what was lost. And it isn't over for the people of California. I'm glad we're finally paying attention. So thank you again for this award. I'm humbled and floored and honored, and I wish I could be there with all of you tonight. Thank you. And the winner of our silver medal in nonfiction is Light on Fire, The Art and Life of Sam Francis by Gabrielle Seltz. A beautifully written biography of the California abstract expressionist painter, Sam Francis. This is the definitive work on an important artist who is also one of the founders of the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art. It's based on the author's unprecedented access to Francis's private papers and correspondence, as well as interviews with family members and close associates in Europe and Japan. This is a book that adds significantly to our knowledge of the California art scene. And now, let's hear from Gabrielle Seltz. I am deeply honored and humbled to be among the recipients of the 91st Annual California Book Awards. I'm especially grateful to the jurors who bring expertise, devotion, passion, and basically give up months of their reading time to select these winners. It's a formidable task, since there is such a rich pool of talent here in California. I want to thank John Seed, who told me I should write Sam's biography. I didn't think I could do it. Sam had a very big life, and I wasn't an expert on his art, just an admirer. To wrestle his achievements, his failures, his sorrows, his grand schemes into a manuscript seemed impossible. But then something miraculous happened. I went to meet the executive president of the Sam Francis Foundation, Deborah Burchette Lear. And while we talked about Sam over lunch, the book arrived almost fully formed in my head. I think that's what Sam meant when he said he saw his paintings in rooms inside him. His job was to bring them forth. That's no small task. But still, it's about having faith in a vision. Thank you, Deborah and the Sam Francis Foundation for having faith in me. Thank you, Kim Robinson and the rest of the UC Press team for turning my manuscript into a beautiful book. Thank you to my publicist, Sarah Russo, for getting the word out about the book and to members of my writing group, North 24th. I am so glad I had your wind in my sails. Your guidance kept me on course. Thank you. Our next categories are juvenile and young adult, presented by Roz Chang. In our juvenile category, the finalists are Legacy by Nikki Grimes, The Legend of Auntie Po by Xing Yin Court, Kaleidoscope by Brian Selznick. Wishes by Moon T. Van and Victor Nye. Genius Under the Table by Eugene Yelchin. The winner of our gold medal in juvenile is Wishes by Moon T. Van and illustrated by Victor Nye. This picture book offers children a gentle exposure to some of life's harder aspects. In this case, a family's flight from danger in one country to a safer place. A spare text of simple statements and rich illustrations which convey complicated emotions tell the story from the perspective of inanimate objects. The book is a thoughtful and moving collaboration of text and illustrations, successfully presenting to children the universal theme of home. And now, Let's hear from Moon T. Van and Victor Nye. Hi, I'm Moon T. Van, and I'm the author of Wishes. Thank you so, so much for this incredible honor. And as a longtime resident of California, someone who's been calling this beautiful state my home for more than a decade now, this award is especially meaningful. Wishes is a story I have always wanted to tell, and it's a story that I needed to tell for myself, for my family, 
for my community, and for the larger world. But it wasn't until several years ago, when certain political events transpired, that I felt a new urgency to tell this story. And to tell it as honestly as I could. I hope that when readers read this story, they can understand that the human experience is incredibly diverse and that things like privilege and security are not evenly distributed. I hope the story opens readers' hearts and I hope that it actually brings us closer together and helps us understand one another better. I've been especially moved by readers who have seen themselves in this story and have seen their own family's experiences reflected in this story. And I have to thank Victor Nye for her amazing and sensitive art for bringing the story to life. And to Celia Lee and the entire team at Scholastic who have worked on this book, who have supported it, who have published it, and who have continued bringing this story into the homes and the libraries of so many readers. Thank you to all of you for widening the reach of this story with this award. Thank you for believing in it and for supporting it. And I hope that together, uh, you know, this book will play a small part in helping make the world a little bit safer and kinder and fairer for everyone. Hi everyone, this is Vic Tong Ai. I'm the illustrator for Wishes. Uh, thank you so much for this special award. It really means a lot to me. Uh, I really love how the story is told by inanimate objects and wishes. I think the passivity is not only poetic, but also touches on how little choices individuals have in times of great changes and turmoils. The third person perspective uh, also make it all the more universal and relatable to anyone who has to leave their homes and search for a better life. Since there are only 75 words in this book, uh, the biggest challenge for an illustrator uh, would be to visualize the unspoken space in between the lines. Uh, I have to make sure the readers understand that the wishes are in fact made by the protagonist, uh, the little girl, so the book can bring home the emotional punch and its powerful message. Um, this is mostly done by positioning the little girl in each spread in a way that it feels like we're seeing the journey through her eyes. Since the manuscript is so sparse, I knew the artwork need to uh, carry the heavy lifting in creating an immersive world. Uh, so I tried to convey tactility, temperature, and other sensory experiences with the artwork. I hope that through the coarseness of the walls, the dampness of the rain, and the heat of the sun, uh, the reader can really feel like they're part of this harrowing journey. Thank you. In our young adult category, the finalists are Blackbirds in the Sky by Brandy Cobert, Home is Not a Country by Safia Ihillo, Mirror Season by Anna Marie McLemore, Instructions for Dancing by Nicola Yoon. And the winner of our Young Adult Gold Medal is Home is Not a Country by Safia Ihillo. Feeling like an outsider, a 14-year-old first-generation Muslim American takes a magical journey to her family's home country, which she believes is her true place in the world. There she meets her other self, the person she could have been. Heartbreaking and hopeful, the teen's odyssey is chronicled through emotion-filled poems as she seeks to find a place to belong. We welcome Safia Hill. 
Hi, my name is Safia Pelo, and I am the author of Home is Not a Country. Um, I am so grateful to the Commonwealth Club and its jurors uh, and the California Book Awards uh, for this just immeasurable honor. Um, I made this book for my community, um, for the aunties and uncles that taught us Arabic on Sundays in the rented room at a middle school. Um, I made it for their children, my friend cousins, my intimate siblings, and for the languages we invented together. Um, I feel like I grew up in an invented world, um, surrounded by the people who made it from scratch with their own hands. And so in doing that made me believe that anything could be made and could be made real. And so truly, I wanted to just make them an offering. And it means the world to me to have that offering be recognized, so thank you. Um, I also would like to thank my editor, Michelle Fry, uh, Christopher Myers, Chris Cam, and the whole team at Make Me A World. I would like to thank my agent, Amy Joan Pekka, for taking a chance on me when, you know, this was like a three-page document and an email. Um, my partner, Christopher Nunez, uh, who kind of gave me a crash course in how to write narrative. Um, as a poet with like a very loose sense of cause and effect, who very quickly had to learn how to write plot. Um, my writing group, team co-work, uh, Elizabeth Acevedo and Clint Smith, who have seen this book and all of my books through basically every draft, um, and who, you know, kept me accountable and got me to finish this thing. Um, it just, thank you. I. I am so moved and I am so grateful. Um, thank you for reading my book and for spending time with this story. Thank you. Our next cat two categories are Californiana and Contribution to Publishing, both presented by Peter Fish. In the category of Californiana, our gold medal goes to Everything Now, Lessons from the City-State of Los Angeles by Rose Kranz Baldwin. In Everything Now, Lessons from the City-State of Los Angeles, Rose Kranz Baldwin explores the layered myths, truths, and truisms of Los Angeles. He discovers the city-state that is, as he writes, both enormously ambiguous and ambiguously enormous. It is a place where lessons are to be learned. Deliberately provocative, deeply researched, vastly entertaining, everything now reveals a Los Angeles that is both comfortably familiar and shockingly strange. And now, here is Rosecrans Baldwin. First, I wanna say thank you to the awards jury and the Commonwealth Club. I've known about the California Book Award for years, uh, so this is a very proud moment for me. I'd like to thank my wife, Rachel Knowles, for all of her support. I am extremely grateful to everyone at MCD Books and Ferrer, Strauss, and Giroux, particularly my publisher and editor, Sean McDonald, my agent, PJ Mark, um, everyone at Django Nesbitt, and then all of the readers and the booksellers, the librarians. The fact that this book has now found people connected with so many Angelinos, Californians, um, I just get extraordinarily a uh, diverse range of letters and emails. It just really means a lot. This little book was a private project for a long time. It was just me and my Honda Accord crisscrossing greater Los Angeles, you know, interviewing dozens of people a couple of years to try and get a sense of what it means to live in this place right now. The book is also, though, a book of books in a way. Um, I'm indebted to really dozens, um, dozens of novels, and short stories, and poems, and collections of nonfiction about Los Angeles, about California. So my greatest thanks goes to the people who shared those stories with me, whether it was the folks who let me hang around in the background while they went about their lives, or just so many authors who've written so movingly about California. 
So thank you again to the Commonwealth Club. It is an honor. Our final category is contribution to publishing. Our winner here is A Rebel's Outcry, biography of Issei, civil rights leader, Sei Fuji, by Jeffrey G. Chin and Fumiko Karo Fujita, Little Tokyo Historical Society. A Rebel's Outcry is a beautifully wrought and illustrated biography of Issei civil rights leader, Sei Fuji. Fuji was a newspaper publisher, attorney, and leader. Born in Japan, he became a visionary uh, leader of the Japanese community of Los Angeles and Southern California in the first half of the 20th century. A Rebel's Outcry is a 10-year label of artistry and love to bring his work and times vividly to life. We welcome Jeffrey Chin from the Little Tokyo Historical Society. Hi, my name is Jeffrey G. Chin, and it's a great honor to be here with you tonight for the 91st Annual California Book Awards. It is also a distinct honor because this is our very first award, and we thank you very much humbly for the gold medal in contribution to publishing on behalf of our team. A Rebel's Outcry, biography of Issei civil rights leader Sei Fuji, 1882 to 1954, is a passion project of over 10 years with the Little Tokyo Historical Society and was the culmination of contributions from many individuals, including the incredible research of the late Kenichi Sato, who wrote Rafu Gegu Ondo, a formal biography entirely in Japanese on Sei Fuji's life. Seifuji was born in 1882. He immigrated to the United States in 1903, and it was said he worked as a houseboy for the Ralph's Market family. He also attended Compton Union High School and later USC Law, graduating in 1911. Due to laws that barred Asians from citizenship, he was not able to acquire a law license. However, he paired up with law school classmate J. Marion Wright, and they later won two major Supreme Court cases, one to build a hospital for his community in response to the 1918 flu epidemic, and later to overturn the alien land law which had prohibited Asian immigrants from owning land. In Seifuji's life, he led labor unions, race relations campaigns, and even started his own newspaper. This research began for me when I met Fumiko Carol Fujita, a retired pharmacist turned historian at a historic preservation forum in San Francisco. Together we produced a short film entitled Little Tokyo Reporter, which starred Academy Award winner Chris Tashima. The project not only inspired great efforts with our historical society, but encouraged us to travel around the globe to tell Seifuji's story. And one of our greatest prides was to share the same path that Kenny Chisato did, visiting the historic alien land property in Boyle Heights, scrolling through the microfilm at UCLA, and visiting Seifuji's ancestral home, even meeting his granddaughter. We got to see the schools, train stations, and visit the ports he had traversed. And the story comes full circle as we were able to honor Seifuji as the first Japanese American in California to receive a posthumous law license thanks to the great efforts of the Japanese American Bar Association. We also built a memorial lantern. Historical Society team members got historic designation for the Japanese hospital as well. And I hope through our book, you can reimagine and revisit the history of the turn of the century through the lens of Seifuji, as you can share in the excitement of a civil rights leader that lived not too long ago in an underrepresented American community. So we can all take pride in his search for the American dream. So I'd like to thank Fumiko Carol Fujita, translator Say Saeko Higa Dickinson, illustrator Takashi Uchida, Editor Naomi Hirahara, layout artist Amy Inoue, text editor Elise Din McGrillis. Our incredible team at the Little Tokyo Historical Society, Sei Fuji, J. Marion Wright, and Kupfer families, the Kashi Mainichi, Hirohishiki's family, City of Iwakuni, Aurora Foundation, and of course the late Kenichi Sato, UCLA Aritani Care, and the, UC, uh, the Union Bank Foundation, who provided us grant funds to publish this book. Special thanks to our book team, including Jerry Nakafuji and former intern Marissa Nakata, who identified it, this prestigious award to us, and my family and friends who've been cheering us along the way. And of course, 
Sei Fuji. Without him, we would have no story to tell. And that in itself is significant. In fact, right behind me is his ancestral home, uh, which stands to this day. And I hope to continue sharing his story, not only to his family, but people around the globe. So it's an honor to be amongst all of you today. And congratulations to everyone here. This concludes the 91st Annual California Book Awards Ceremony. Congratulations to all our medal winners and to all of our finalists. Thank you all for joining us in the celebration of the depth and breadth and creativity of California literature. And as always, happy reading.